Oh, that's good. I'm glad you had a good time. Um, luckily, he wasn't had Put it in the front, yeah. 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 So, why don't we send on Bonnick there and try to start getting some of the colors tracked right now? And you might think it's, it's, it's uh, kind of strange that it doesn't do anything, but um, once you start seeing some of the things, you realize, well, it must be doing something. So let's go ahead and uh, finish the handbombing thing for three days, which is, uh, before we get to North Station, we haven't done the North Station case, but so the North Station case is going to come out easy. So we're just working with exactly the same thing right now. Are we all set to go? Okay. Thanks, Brad. Um, so let X be a real or complex vector space. And uh, let Z be a subspace. And uh, F is a linear functional. On Z, and assume, assume we have a semi norm. We are given a semi norm C of X on X. So that C of X plus Y is less than or equal to C of X plus C of Y, and C of alpha of X equals F the value of alpha times C of X. For all X and Y and X, and for all X and X and scalar alpha. Okay, that implies that this is a non-negative function. In particular. Uh, but you don't know that uh, the P of X may be zero without X being equal to zero. Px okay. Px c like a c c like a norm. C of x like norm of x, but it is possible. It is possible that um, p of x equal to zero, uh, with x not equal to zero. A really simple example, we'll give it a little bit later. Really simple example. I don't know. Okay. Then, uh, then there exists an extent, an F tilde linear functional. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the rest of my hypothesis. The rest of my hypothesis is that assume that. The absolute value of f of x is less than equal to p of x for x belonging to this subspace. Then there exists a linear extension, f tilde from z to x is the terminology the author uses. Okay. With uh, the property that f tilde of x and absolute value is less than the p of x for all x in the full vector space capital X. Very. Okay.
Maybe the mute button is on. Is that possible? Okay. Okay, it looks like the battery light's on now, maybe. That's good, huh? How's the volume now? Not very good? We just need to speak louder? No, it's just because I'm picking up a lot of background. Picking up a lot of background. Okay, this is not the good microphone. Sorry, folks. Not the good micro microphone. Uh, okay. I don't know. I don't know who watches it. Those are the other two students in the class. <laughs> That's all I know. Alex has been watching it and he has it on his iPod. Did you show me? No. He had a show. Wow. He, he, he had you on there. He was showing everybody. He watches it. He wow. carries you around with him everywhere now. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> That's scary. Okay. Maybe we should make some more in, uh, mistakes. Hi, Alex. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's finish this thing up. We already did the real case. Let's do the complex case. So the basic idea is to write a complex linear functional f of x as f1 of x plus i f2 of x. This is for uh, x in z now. Okay. Two of x, right? Now, are they actually uh, real linear? Well, f itself is linear, complex linear. Right, so if I take a real scalar, if alpha is in the reals, then f of alpha x equals alpha f of x on the one hand, but it's also equal to f1 of alpha x plus i f2 of alpha x. But what is alpha f of x? So on, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's this, okay? But alpha f of x is equal to alpha f1 of x plus i alpha f2 of x. So I'm doing is multiplying through by a real number alpha. Okay. All right, so I have this. I can multiply f of x by alpha, and I get I just multiply each of these terms by alpha. So I get this. So I have two representations of, of alpha f of x. It's f1 of alpha x plus i f2 of alpha x. It's also equal to alpha f1 of x plus i alpha f2 of x. Well, by equating real and imaginary parts now, because alpha was real, I simply get that f1 of alpha x is alpha f1 of x and, alpha, and f2 of alpha x equals alpha f2 of x, equating real and imaginary parts. Since alpha is real, equating real and imaginary parts we obtain that f1 and f2 are both real, linear. Okay, that's just the scaling part, but that was the important part. The addition formula is trivial. Okay? So f1 and f2 are both real linear. So what I can do is I can consider f1 on a real vector space. And I mentioned last time, even though that z is a complex vector space, any complex vector space can be regarded also as a real vector space. The actual vectors in the complex vector space may be complex valued and so on and so forth, the vectors themselves. But what you do is you allow scale, real scalar multiplication only. I think last time I gave the example of complex matrices. All complex matrices, that's the vector space, over the reals. I just, I can multiply any complex matrix by a real number, I get a, get a complex matrix, and so on. So I can consider the real vector space. Well, all right. So these are real valued, real linear functionals, okay? F1 and F2. 
that's what I'm going to do because I need to apply uh, the, I'm going to apply the real case all right to extend all right by so we already had proved the real case last time um, actually all we're going to do is apply force point two dash one we don't even have to use the same theorem here so um, I want to get one more consequence though before I actually do that. How, can I, how, am I, how extending F1, how is that going to help? <coughs> Idea, extend X, F1. F1 from um, Z sub R, a real vector space, with elements same as Z. Okay. So you just it just has the same exact elements, only you can only consider real scalar multiplication. All right. Two uh, F one tilde on X sub R. So little sub R corresponds to real. Okay. Why is that going to be any good? Well, such that um, F1 of X less than or equal to absolute F1 of X, okay. Well, since, okay, this is possible, okay, such that, uh, what do I want? such that uh, F1 tilde of X is less than or equal to P of X on uh, X of R. Okay. How can I do that? Let's just make sure that I can do this first. Make sure we can do this. Idea. Make sure the, this is possible because F1 of X itself, okay, is less than or equal to the absolute value of F1 of X, which is less than or equal to the absolute value of F of X, okay which is less than the P of X by assumption on Z equals Z sub Z which as a, as a set of vectors is the same as Z sub R equals vector wise Z sub R okay Okay, so you had a linear functional on z sub r, f1 of x. I didn't show f1 of x plus y equals f1 of x plus f1 of y, but that's kind of obvious. On z sub r, you have the inequality that I need um, to apply theorem 4 to 1. That's actually, actually, I'm going to need, I don't actually need theorem 4, 3, dash 1. I only need 4, 2, 1, all right? So this is this is possible. This is possible because this, therefore, let's, let's therefore um, let's call this a name. Let's that one. This holds. Therefore, one holds by 4.2-1. The real case. The, the uh, real part, 
of an imaginary number and absolute value is less than or equal to the absolute value of the imaginary number itself. Okay. That's, that's the absolute value of A less than or equal to the absolute value of A plus BI. That's just what I'm saying. It's the absolute value of A less than or equal to the absolute value of A plus BI. That's all I'm saying here. Okay? Which the absolute value of A plus BI is the square root of A squared plus B squared. Okay? So, so that's always being used there. And I made this assumption. Okay? I made this assumption for all x and z, which is the same set of elements as z are. So this is a fact that f of f1 of x is less equal to p of x. Therefore, I can apply the original hahn bonnach theorem directly and get there is a real linear extension, real linear extension of f to the whole space regarded as a real vector space. All right? So I'm only considering real scalar multiplication and so on uh, for this f1 tilde. Okay? Real linearity for F1 tilde. Why is this going to be any good? Because I want to get complex linearity for the whole, for some F tilde. How am I even going to generate an F tilde, a complex linear F tilde, out of F1 tilde? That's what I want to do. Well, useful because let's consider an identity. There's some identity, just to have it a complex linear uh, functional, if you write it down this way, there's going to be a certain identity between the real and imaginary parts. Okay? Namely, f of i x, take the original complex linear functional. All right? Original functional. Complex linear functional. Functional here, okay? So everybody can sort of, I'm talking about the original complex linear functional. If I put i x in there, then on the one hand that's equal to i f of x, okay? On the other hand, that's equal to uh, f1 of i x, so do the same thing as I did before, plus i f2 of i x. But now multiplying through by i for the original thing, that's equal to i times f1 of x minus f2 of x, okay? Because i times i is minus 1. So if I take the original expression f of x and multiply by i, I get this last thing I wrote down. So I got two expressions again. I get to pull the i out because f is complex linear. So what do I get? I get an identity, and I think the one I'm going to want is that, the one I'm going to use in this particular example is that um, f2 of x is minus f1 i x. f2, this thing, is the same as this real number here. This is the real part, except up to the minus sign. This is the real part here in this complex number. Right, because that's a real number, f1 of ix. ix is a is a good vector in my vector space because I had a complex vector space. So f1 of ix can be computed. Right, since ix is actually in uh, uh, x is in z, and x is in z, ix is in z. Okay, in the here. Okay. Because z is a complex vector space, okay. So as a set of vectors, there's no problem to evaluate f1 at ix, okay. So therefore, what I get is from equating these two pieces, all right, equate real parts, equate real parts. I obtain the identity. star identity that f2 of x is minus f1 of ix for all x in uh, z, okay? Just call it Z this time, okay? <laughs> okay.
The reason for the subscript R is only to remind ourselves that we're only considering real functionals in this, in this case. So the, the F1 is only real. Okay, so now, therefore, I can define, now I claim now the following definition will work. Claim F tilde of X equals F1 tilde of X plus minus I. So I'm going to multiply this by I, right? I need an I F2, all right? To extend F, I need an IF2 for the imaginary part. I want to extend F, so I want to write, want to write an IF2 of X. Okay, so that means I want to write a minus IF1 of IX, and then to extend up with the tilde. Okay, so I claim that this extends. Um, F of X, all right, obviously it does because of what we've done so far, all right, and it's complex linear, all right, so it extends F of X is trivial because F1 of X already extend, extended F1, all right, so extends in the sense of uh, being equal, okay? The fact that it's linear will be trivial, okay? From everything else being linear, things add, okay? And then I just have to make sure that the scalar multiplication works out. Okay, so this I need to check. Need to check. Okay, now whether it have, now I need, finally I need to of course, check that it satisfies the inequality f1 tilde of x in absolute value less or equal to p of x. Otherwise, it won't have anything. Okay, and I, I and mean, this is a claim that uh, claim extends is complex linear. Let's call this uh, um, and satisfies. Uh, let's call it uh, double star uh, f tilde of x in absolute value less or equal to p of x on x. Okay? So I needed to get that too. Alright? So let's check the complex linearity. How does that go? So in other words, what we're saying is we have a general recipe. As long as they had it for the real case, they can get it for the complex case for free. <laughs> when, I, when I make this um, statement with a semi-norm, okay, I needed a semi-norm in the statement of the Hanbonic theorem in order to get, I need to have the right statement, then the real case implies the complex case, <laughs> okay. So check complex linearity. So what I'm going to do is I take, I need to take um, F tilde, of a plus bi times x, okay? And I need to show that I can bring the a plus bi out, I outside, okay? And so you have that this is equal to, according to this formula, f1 tilde of a plus bi times x minus i f1 tilde of i times a plus bi times x, okay? Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the real linearity of F1 tilde, okay? So F1 tilde is on XR, all right? So I can, whenever, I can use additivity and I can bring out real scalars, all right? So how does that work now? Well, there's an AX here, so I can bring that out. So I have, this is equal to, ah, uh, here it is, there was an AX. So this is F1 tilde, there's an AX here, And there's a B, and I won't be able to, I'll have to leave the I inside. But by real linearity, this is therefore F1 tilde, excuse me, F1 
it's a f1 tilde of x plus b f1 tilde of i x. Okay. Now what is this? I a minus b, right? If I multiply this out, this is I a minus b for this scalar. Okay. I times b i is minus b. So that's this this so. So I can bring out a negative b. Well, there's a negative i and a negative b, so that's a plus i b. There's a negative i and there's a negative b. I bring the negative b out because it's real linear. Okay, that cancels the minus sign of the negative b cancels that minus sign. I get a plus i b. F1 tilde of what's left was x there, and then I have one more term. I can bring the a out, not the i. And so I bring out minus i a f1 tilde of i x. Okay, so we'll leave the i on the inside there. Now, so it's everything is in terms of f1 tilde. Now we just group terms. Group, I got a plus i b. This is by the real linearity of f1 tilde. So now I just uh, group terms. This is a plus i b times f1 tilde of x from the first and the third terms. And then it's also um, a something with a b minus i a. But I'm just going to bring a minus i out. And that's going to be minus i times a plus b i. So from these last two terms. I'm not doing anything with the f tildes. They're just following suit by the distributive law of multiplication with respect to addition. Okay, and then f1 tilde of ix. Okay, so what you see now that is exactly a plus bi times f tilde of x. So all I've done here is collect terms. Okay? And then I just saw that it was equal to that. So the conflict linearity hold. All right, now let's see if we can get the uh, semi-norm inequality. This is what I've got now. The trick here is basically to use, uh, to write things in polar form. Um, what I know is that if I've got, a, uh, if I have a complex number, any complex number zeta can be written as the absolute value of zeta times um, e to the minus i theta. Okay. Um, yeah, times e to the plus i theta, okay, <laughs> I'm right that way, where theta is the, the argument or of the complex number, okay? That's just a polar form. And if, if zeta is equal to zero, then you can just make this equal to one. There's no angle then. Theta doesn't exist if zeta equal to zero. Theta, take theta equal to zero if zeta equal to zero in this form. Okay? That's done in the next section. I just warn you of that a little bit. Where he calls this, this e to the i theta, he calls it e of zeta or something like that. Okay? Instead of calling it e to the i theta, he just names it something. So you'll see this in the next section. Okay? So that means that the absolute value of zeta is equal to z the, the complex zeta times e to the minus i theta. Okay. Just going to write like that. <laughs> Just write it the other way. Okay? So there. So that means that I can write the absolute value of f tilde of x. I just need to show that that's less frequent with p of x. That's equal to f tilde of x times e to the minus i theta. But now, by complex linearity, I can bring the e to the minus i theta inside. So 
See, that's kind of strange to do, but you can do that, <laughs> okay? So that's F tilde of e to the minus i theta times x. Okay, now what I have is that this is a real quantity evaluated at that vector because it's the absolute value. All right, so I changed the vector, and I got F tilde at that new vector equal to a positive real number, not a negative real number. And therefore, this is equal to F1 of tilde at this new vector. Okay. And I know that that's less than, or, and I know that that is um, less than or equal by this number one, by one, that's less than or equal to P at e to the minus i theta x. Okay? By one, it's just right here. Okay? On all vectors in x r. All right? But since p is itself um, a semi-norm, this is equal to the absolute value e to the i minus i theta, p of x, which is equal to p of x. Okay? So I use a semi-norm property there, pretty essentially. So I can bring out the scalar with the absolute value sign. So I'm done. Norm, the absolute value of f tilde is less than or equal to p of x. Uh, this is real. Real and not negative. So therefore, if I have, to have the real and non-negative evaluation, then of course it's the complex linear functional. If its value is got equal to its real part, okay. So there it is. All right. <coughs> so that's the trick, and that's the end of the proof. So now we have the harmonic theorem for real for a complex vector spaces. What's the version for normed vector spaces? Let's get basically all the corollaries at this point. So now I'll quickly get the corollaries. This is half a page in the notes or something. So 4.3 dash 3 on Bonnach theorem for norm spaces. So there's no um, real or complex uh, division needed now. And we just have the following. Suppose X is a normed space. I'm sorry, this is 4, 3, 2. Okay. And let's take a bounded linear functional on a subspace. So now we're going to take bounded linear functional, not just a linear functional. Before, we didn't have a norm on the space. There were all these absolute value signs, but there was, they had a semi-norm P. Okay, but there was no, you know, norm on the vector space. Yeah. How about looking for norm space? Let X be a norm space. And let Z be a subspace. And let F be a bounded linear functional. on Z with norm norm F sub Z so regarding Z as a norm space in its own right it doesn't have to be a Bonnach space it just has to be a norm so Z doesn't have to even be a closed um, I mean, X doesn't even have to be complete okay uh, so, then there exists a linear extension F tilde from Z to X with the norm of F tilde now on the whole space X equal to the norm of F on the smaller space. So you haven't changed the norms. 
You've extended it linearly, but it hasn't changed the norm. Okay. So what's the proof of that? I just want to apply the previous theorem. I don't have the, the P here, so I have to uh, generate a P to apply it to the previous theorem. Okay. I guess I'll keep this double star over here because that's what I'm going to actually need to. Uh, that's what I'm going to get by the application. So, and that's what I'm going to use. Okay. So define this. Um, first, all right. Choose the proof uh, choose P of X equal to a norm it's going to be the norm of F sub Z that number all right, times the norm of X so itself is a, is a norm unless the uh, linear functional is trivial if it's the zero functional of course then it's no good it's just a well of course it's still a semi norm the zero <laughs> kills everything. All right? But that's clearly now a semi-norm. All right? It's a uh, sub-additive and it has the scaling. Okay? Uh, this is actually a norm. So it's just a scalar multiple of the other norm. So that's just another norm. As long as the F is not equal to F uh, Z to R. Z to K is not equal to zero. Okay? <laughs> All right. But in any case, it's a semi norm. So the trivial case is trivial anyway. If you took F equal to zero, obviously you can just continue to have F tilde equal to zero. Okay? That's all you can do here. So what do I what do we need to check? Check that check that the hypothesis. Check the hypothesis of four point three dash one. And the only hypothesis is that the absolute value of f of x okay, should be less than or equal to p of x. Well by for any bounded linear functional, this is less than or equal to the norm of f sub z times x, okay, by the definition of the norm. Of a linear, of a bounded linear functional. Okay? For all for all x and z. And of course that's equal to p of x now. Okay. <laughs> so the hypothesis is satisfied. So this is the definition of the norm of z, and this is by definition of p of x. Okay? So this is true for all x and z. Therefore, so, therefore, the extension exists. F tilde from uh, extension of f exists. Okay? And let's see how's that going to work. So now with f tilde of x in absolute value less than or equal to the norm of f sub z times the norm of x because that's my p of x. P of x. I'll put the p of x here equal to that. Okay. I always said I can extend like that. So, but p of x is equal to this. Now I have an inequality involving a linear functional f tilde of x and the norm of x on one side with a constant intervening. Therefore, by definition of the norm of f tilde on x, this is for x and x, 
So therefore, by the definition of the norm of F tilde, I have the norm of F tilde is less than the norm of F sub z. Okay, so it's no, but certainly it's not less than, because already in z, I can, uh, the soup comes up to the norm of F sub z. So let me write that down. I can never have, the linear extension can never have a smaller norm. Okay, automatically, but I'll just write that down. Uh, but the soup of F tilde of X, the norm of F, but the norm of F tilde equals a soup for uh, X in capital X, um, norm X equal to 1, okay, F tilde of X in absolute value, that's always greater than or equal to the soup for X in V, norm X equal to 1, F tilde of X. But that's, of course, and now if I'm looking at X and Z, F tilde of X is just F of X equal to the soup X and Z, norm X equal to 1, F of X, which is the norm of F on Z. So you can never get the smaller norm, okay? I'll put this X here, okay? Therefore, this is the whole thing right here. Therefore, in this box, hence by, let's call this something else, triple star, okay? Hence by triple star and the above fact that the norm of an extension cannot be smaller than the norm of the extendee. <laughs> Okay, we have we have established the proof. We have that the norm of F tilde on the whole space X is equal to the norm of F on the subspace Z. Okay. Now you might say, well, that's trivial in some sense. It is if the if the space is a Hilbert space or finite dimensional. Okay, as follows. Let's take the Reese representation theorem and see that this is um, not difficult to do, <laughs> okay, if the space is not too hairy, okay? Indeed, uh, just check this. Check this result for a Hilbert space. Okay, so what you have is that uh, is that uh, if x equals h, if x equals h, and if um, z is a closed subspace of a of this x, okay, then z is itself a Hilbert space, so I'm, at least in, I'm working only in these closed subspace case now, Hilbert space, so by reach representation theorem, Reese is a little representation theorem, there's a lot of Reese in here, Okay. Representation. Then I have that that my f of x is equal to x comma z naught for some z naught in z the Hilbert space, and for all x in z. Okay. 
he wrote this a little funny in the book because so I'm fixing a Z naught I know that F of X equals F sub Z naught of X is equal to that we know that if you're on a Hilbert space you have this recess representation that was theorem uh, what was that way back in chapter 3 wasn't it yeah 3.8-1, yeah. You had to use, did you have to use that? <laughs> okay, <laughs> probably. It's been so long since I did the exam, I think you have to. Yeah. There you have it. So as long as every bonding functional on a Hilbert space can be represented in terms of the inner product, there's some element of the Hilbert space that you can write. So here I'm re regarding Z itself as the Hilbert space. Sub, a closed subspace of a given Hilbert space is a Hilbert space. So I can write it that way. Okay. And the norm of F, the norm of F in this case, the norm of F sub Z, okay, is equal to the norm of this little Z naught. Okay, in the original norm in the original Hilbert space. Okay. Now, what's an extension? Obviously, I can extend this for all x in capital X equal to Hilbert space because the real Hilbert, it's the Hilbert space inner product simply by just putting a capital X in place of a capital Z. <laughs> okay, that's an extension. Okay, and its norm is still the same because remember, whenever we computed the norm of this linear functional, it always came out to be the norm of Z naught by the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So this is trivial to extend. In other words, I don't do anything except change the name of X in capital Z to X in capital X. <laughs> okay, so therefore, F tilde of X therefore equals uh, X Z naught X in capital X extends F with uh, the norm of F tilde also equal to the norm of Z naught. Okay? And so that's it. So let's look at problem 4.3.6. This must be the easiest problem in the book. Okay. Once you see what's going on, 4.3.6 says, look at the following thing. Let's take H equal R3. <laughs> okay, let's take X equals R3 and z equals r2, let's say is the, the xy plane, or the c1, c2 plane in r3, okay? So it's z equals the set of all c1, c2, comma, zero, all right, in r3. So the c1 and c2 are real. So I get the real Hilbert space. Okay, find it dimensional. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So now let's take, of course, we know that uh, F, any F uh, linear functional on R2 is written part of linear functional. Uh, this is assuming that F is a bonded linear functional. F bonded linear functional. I didn't say any linear functional, but a bonded linear functional is written. Okay, in a finite dimensional case, of course, any linear functional is bounded. But I needed, in this previous example, I needed to take a bounded linear functional. I'm, sometimes I'm forgetting my word bounded. When I'm working with the norm space, but I'm always going to be talking about bounded when I'm working with the norm space. Okay? A li F linear functional R2 is written F of, of C1, C2, 0 equals alpha 1, C1 plus alpha 2, C2. And what's the norm of that linear function? The norm of that linear function, anybody remember on R2? What's the norm of that? So 
So any one can be written that for some fixed alpha 1 and alpha 2, some fixed. Which is exactly this form over here, where z naught is the alpha 1, alpha 2, comma 0. So some fixed scalars, right? Written like this. What's the, the norm of that would be, what's the norm of that? That would be the soup. I'll just write it out one more time, just so everybody believes me. Absolute value alpha 1 C1 plus alpha 2 C2 over the square root of C1 squared plus C2 squared. That's the norm. Uh, C1 squared plus C2 squared square root uh, unequal to zero. Okay? <laughs> That's the norm of, of F as a linear functional on this Z, F sub Z. Right? I don't... Okay. So, um, what is that? That is equal to uh, the square root of alpha 1 squared plus alpha 2 squared. <laughs> okay. I mean, you can do that by the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality again. The numerator is less than or equal to the square root of alpha 1 squared plus alpha 2 squared. So that's just what it looks like. It's exactly fitting this this business here because the norm, the Euclidean norm is simply the Hilbert space norm. Okay. My, this is my this is my z naught. My z naught. Then my little z naught is alpha one, alpha two, comma zero. That's an element of my Hilbert space. Okay. So it fits this Hilbert space paradigm exactly. Now, how do I linearly extend? Well, that's my z naught. So my linear extension is trivial. It's f tilde <laughs> of c f tilde c1 c2 c3 equals the same expression alpha 1 c1 plus alpha 2 c2 plus 0 c3. All right? So f tilde of c1 c2 c3 is equal to uh, alpha 1 c1 plus alpha 2 c2 plus 0 c3. All right? That's the linear extension that's going to have the same norm. If I put anything else down there in front of the C3, the norm's going to be bigger. Right? Because the norm is simply the norm of the vector that I, that I uh, inner product with. That's simply what the norm is going to be. So I have to put the zero there to maintain the same norm and no bigger. Remember, the norm will always have to be just as big, but it can easily be bigger. All right? So I can put, I can put anything here to extend f, all right? but not to extend f with the same norm. I can put anything here to extend, because obviously when I put c3 equal to 0, those two things will be the same. Because when I, I to, talking about the extent, I'm going to set C3 equal to 0 to check whether they're equal on R2. Okay, well, they're obviously they're equal then. Okay. But now I'll put 0 here. That makes the norm the same. Anything else will make the norm bigger. So those, that's the only extension I can have. See? So there is, it is unique in this case. Since I have to have the alpha one and alpha two the same to extend, all right? Alpha one and alpha two must be there, must be the same. Coefficients uh, over. Since again, should I should I argue this more? Since C next C next board. <laughs> okay. I'm erasing the inequality that you always have at least as big since f tilde uniquely determined 
as F tilde of C1, C2, C3 equals alpha 1 C1 plus alpha 2 C2 plus 0 C3 since um, F tilde of C1, C2, C3 has to be of the form beta 1 C1 plus beta 2 C2 plus beta 3 C3 for some beta 1, beta 2, beta 3 in R. Okay, some fixed scalars. But extension, extension property requires requires after setting C3 equal to zero that beta 1 is equal to alpha 1 and beta 2 is equal to alpha 2. Okay. And the, the norm and finally the norm of F tilde on all of R3 is equal to the square root of beta 1 squared plus beta 2 squared plus beta 3 squared. Okay. So if beta 3 is not equal to 0, then the norm of F tilde on R3 is strictly bigger than the norm of F on R2, which was equal to the square root of alpha 1 squared plus alpha 2 squared. All right, so this is all that I can do in this case. I hope that's clear now, <laughs> okay, that I can't do anything else. So we say, in that, from this point of view, from the point of view of Euclidean space, this is, whole business is trivial. Okay. <laughs> but uh, we're not working in Euclidean space. So let's get a couple more examples, and then we'll be done with this first few sections. Um, there's another couple of nice little corollaries here. One is to say that, that the uh, linear functionals are um, the bundle linear functionals are rich enough to distinguish points. In other words, um, I think the problem is um, so-called. Um, see what's the property. That looking at problem number eleven in four point three. If f of x equals f of y for every bundle linear functional on a norm space, then x equals y. That's the property that I can distinguish points by checking all the values of the bonded linear functionals. All right? Fx equals Fy for all F, then X must equal Y. That means if Fx unequal to Y, Fy for some F, then X is unequal to Y. All right? So in particular, if F of X equal to zero for all F bonded linear functionals, then X must be zero. All right, that's trivial in the real Euclidean case, but it's not so trivial in general. Okay, so the bonded linear functionals are rich enough to just to separate points. Is the uh, verbiage that gets used? Okay, points in the space, in the original space. So how do we get that? We need quickly to do that. Um, first. There's problem excuse me, 4.3-3, which is then immediately applied to 4.3-4, which gives you the separation property. 4.3-3, so x is a norm space. And um, x naught unequal to 0 is in x, OK? then there exists a linear functional of norm 1 f tilde uh, bonded linear functional on x 
with f the norm is equal to 1 and f tilde of x naught is equal to the norm of x naught, that positive real number, or not negative real, yeah, positive real number, okay? Okay. Proof? So, in other words, I can just say there's one like that. I need to find a linear functional to extend. <laughs> okay. Proof? Let z equal the span of the single vector x naught. Okay. Equals the set of all alpha x naught, alpha in my scalars. Okay. Define f of alpha x naught to equal alpha times the norm of x naught. Okay, so it's just alpha times that non-negative number, or positive number. Okay? So it's just a simple, obviously that's a linear functional. Okay? Uh, and linear functional and bottom linear functional, what's the bound? What's the norm? What's the norm of f? The norm of f, okay, is equal to the soup overall scalars alpha. Okay, that's all my vectors. Uh, the f of x, uh, f of x is uh, x equals alpha x naught. Okay, x unequal to zero. Okay, f, I'm going to put it in this form. F of, w, f of x over the norm of x. Okay, right? Because the only thing in my vector space is x equals alpha x naught. Okay, so now that's equal to, let's see, that's um, absolute value. So this is going to be absolute value of alpha, absolute value of x naught. What's, what's the norm of x? That's going to be the absolute value of alpha. Uh, <laughs> okay, maybe we can put alpha here like this, make it clear. This is the absolute value of the of value, okay? I mean, it's clear the norm, the norm of such a trivial linear function is just going to be the, the scaling, the, the thing that I multiply by, I multiply the scalar by this other thing, okay? The positive number didn't have to be positive, it could have been anything, okay? The absolute value of that thing is going to be the norm. So this equals 1, okay? So the norm of f is 1 because, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this trivial, no, 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 so this norm is 1, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said it wrong, the norm is not this number, it's just equal to 1, the number scales out. Okay, so this has norm 1. They okay, take the value of the functional, divide by the norm of x, okay, and everything, the x naught just scales out. Okay. Ugh. Yeah, you would expect that. Uh, yeah, you expect that if I if I take. Uh, so in other words, if I take uh, on the real line, if I take f of t equal to 100 t, okay, okay, for t in the reals, that's a linear functional, right? And what's the, what's the bound on that thing, okay? Did I do this right? Is that what I meant? F of t, no, I have f of 100 t, yeah, this is what I did. I say I did this, no wonder. That's what I did. I said f of 100 t is 100 t. <laughs> that's what I did here. Okay. Actually, this is what I did. I did f of f of 100. F of let's say plus or minus a you know plus. Yeah, that's what I did. F of 100 t is the t times the 100. That's basically what I said here. Now, so that makes sense that the norm is just one. Okay. <laughs> The t is the alpha. The x naught is the hundred. Okay. So the fact is, I'm just saying f of x equals x. Okay, <laughs> basically. Okay. All right. So that's what it is. So the norm is one. That's why the norm is one. Okay. So the norm is one. 
and therefore uh, it can be, of course, this linear function can be linear extended um, by 4.3 dash 2 to have to an extension with the same norm. Okay, so therefore there exists f tilde with f tilde of norm 1, okay, and f tilde of alpha x naught is equal to alpha times the norm of x naught. So that means that in particular the f tilde of x naught, if I take alpha equal to 1, that implies that f tilde of x naught is equal to the norm of x naught. Because f, f tilde has to extend this, okay? This linear functional. This is a linear functional. It's a linear function in functional. The variable is x equals alpha x naught. Okay, it's only a one dimensional space there. If I take two different alphas, alpha one and alpha two, and add, obviously this adds. Okay, it has this, the, the norm scaling. Okay. So if I take alpha equals one, then I get this. All right, so that's an immediate consequence. Okay, now what do you get out of that of x? Well, I can show the soup equal to the norm of x. That's all I can do, because I can't show greater than, because it's always less than or equal to. So I'm going to show you can get up to it. But you can by the previous result, because let x, be, let x equal x naught now. x was just x naught, okay? Then there exists f tilde sub x naught, okay? Uh, in x prime with f tilde sub x naught, because the f tilde depended on this x naught, okay? In some sense. With f tilde of x naught of norm equal to 1, and f tilde of, of x naught at x naught equal to the norm of x naught. So now if I plug that in to this formula, and take that f tilde as my element of the dual space, okay? and just plug it in, then I have f tilde at x naught divided by the, uh, the norm of f tilde. That comes, out to the absolute, that comes out to the norm of x naught divided by 1 equals the norm of x naught. Therefore, I can get the norm of x naught. I can get up to the norm of x naught by choosing this f tilde. Okay? So sup is attained. By... Uh, at value x naught, okay? By the f tilde, okay? So I get equality. Therefore, if, for example, so I, as I said, if if x is a vector so that for every boundary linear functional, f at x is equal to zero, then the norm of x must equal to zero. So if you annihilate x with all the bilinear functionals, then you've then the only way you could do that is x was equal to zero. All right. So that gives you the exercise by linearity. 4.3.11 follows. Okay. F of x equal to zero for all f in the dual implies x equal to zero. So this implies problem 4.3.11. Okay. Problem. So, so that's our abstract business for the month. Okay. <laughs> okay. You get it, you collect all these results. You actually asked to go through in one of your homework problems a lot of stuff. You actually asked to go through in the separable norm space case to actually generate this whole business from scratch. There's an outline and a paragraph in the back of the book, so that's going to be kind of a long problem for your vacation. You're probably going to hate me. Then why can't I just watch TV? Why do I have to do this problem? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> maybe we'll make an extra credit. Okay, maybe I'll do that. So four, that's my wife's paradigm. 4.3.9 extra credit for lots of points, five points, let's say. Okay. So maybe that needs some motivation. Um, yes, on those two credit 
I know. Extra credit, five points. And then um, also on 4.3.14, you're supposed to be considering a real norm space. That's a typo, I believe, in that problem. Because you're talking about a half space, a hyperplane is of the form um, F tilde of X equals to R, set of all X is that F tilde of X is equal to R, and a half space is going to be the form set of all X such that F tilde of X is less than or equal to R. Okay, something like that. So I can't be talking about complex functionals in that case, because I'm talking about real inequalities. All right, so you're going to need these definitions in 4.3.14. Okay, if you've looked at it, maybe you should. If you haven't looked at it, maybe you should write this down. I'll put it on the next set of notes that I sent out. Okay. Comments or questions at this point? Sorry, I went a little over time. We're done with the Hanbonic theorem, except for applications. <laughs> no, that was not that bad. But anyway, and also except for the extra credit, we work it on a separable norm space. Okay. Thank you.